Okay, thanks for sticking with me. Um, this is the last talk of the day. Um, we've got a little bit of Handel's water music playing in case you're wondering what the tune is. Because you've got to play a little water music. It was either that or uh, Eddie Grant's Electric Avenue. So I went with the, went with the more refined product. Um, and this is looking at um, thinking about collecting data and things. And we're going to look at this uh, in the middle of the talk. So, but it allows you to see something shiny at the beginning of the talk and gives you a little bit of music to listen to. So this is the second talk in the Mechelini series. Um, we've, I've got two of these. This is the more technical one. The other one's more general, this morning's talk that we had. This is uh, somewhat more technical, but also meant for a, a more general audience. So, um, and thank Franklin Electric again, and make sure you thank them if you see them. So what we're gonna be talking about is thinking about uh, hydrogeology from an electrical perspective. Um, so you go out and measure water levels, or you measure water chemistry, and you think about hydrogeology. Um, this is about doing that with electricity. Okay, so um, we're going to think about that. And so we're going to go with three pieces here. We've got defining a groundwater BHAG, and we'll tell you what a BHAG is if you're not familiar with that term. Um, we'll think about putting on electrical glasses and looking around under the ground. Um, and that's what I basically do most days is I put on electrical glasses, look around in the ground and figure out what's going on. And then we'll talk about fuel imaging because fuel is pretty good at showing some of the range of things that happen when you take pictures electrically to understand hydrogeology. Um, the, the picture on the right there is um, taking some pictures through a marsh in Nebraska. And it shows one of the advantages you have if you want to take pictures electrically. Uh, you can just walk through and hook up to the ground and take a picture. You don't need to get a drill rig there. And a drill rig wouldn't be too happy in that marsh, but uh, hooking up a cable to it is pretty easy to do. It's similar to if you went to the doctor and got hooked up with electrodes and checked on you. It's just at your surface. The only difference between me and a medical doctor is I use metal stakes. Generally, medical doctors don't. Um, so <laughs> I have bought medical gel to do my work. Um, and university accountants do ask why you bought a case of medical gel when you're doing geophysics. So. But it, it does work. So if we think about groundwater vision, and we're going to build up a picture. And you guys have pictures of the Edwards Aquifer. And we have nice drawings of that. Here's a nice picture of a flow net. And you see these in books. Um, how many pixels do you have in your picture? In this case, we've got about a half dozen pixels. And we're going to define what's happening under the ground. And you go, well, that's enough. Well, is it? Is it enough to see the detail of what's happening under the ground? So. Um, how many points do you have? And then data quality wise, um, John Wilson from the EPA Ada Lab, he told me that wells can be defined as holes in the ground that lie to you. Um, so what if, what if one of these data points was actually wrong? And you've only got that one data point to decide whether water is going up or down or left or right. Um, you actually are fairly limited with six pixels in developing a three-dimensional picture of a groundwater system. So. Um, it's one of our problems. Now, we've tested that problem, and we've tested how to fix it. Um, so we've done that in the US in Cape Cod. We've done it up in Canada in Borden, because groundwater flows differently if you define a country boundary. Um, and so we ran the same experiment twice, and we've put wells into a simple sand aquifer, um, scared undergrads telling them they need to sample this. Uh, but we figured out that in a simple homogeneous ice tropic for as close as we can find sand aquifer, um, at about 10,000 wells, we know what's going on in 3D. I was giving this slide as a, as a um, way to point out that this is true, but we need to move forward from here. Right before me was a very famous hydrogeologist, and he was using this slide to say, we need to do more of this. I don't think so. Um, you're not going out to Bob's gas station and starting with 10,000 boreholes. You're not going out to anybody's gas station and starting with boreholes. 10,000 boreholes. So in terms of where our science is going to go, this tells our science that a well is not a way to characterize a system. A well is a way to monitor a system. That's why it's called a monitoring well. But it's not called a characterization well because you're trying to characterize processes in 3D with a tool that you cannot get the data density with. So you have to do something different. Um, so one way to go about getting something different is entrepreneurial research. and um, Entrepreneurial to most scientists means money. And it's not actually what the, the word means. There's a book where they studied businesses and how they made money. Right? Entrepreneurial, you want to make money. So they looked at that, and companies that made money didn't want to make money. 
It was basically a side effect of what they were doing. And they compared comparison companies, and the ones that were very successful had a goal. And he, they call it a big, hairy, audacious goal. And what that goal was for very, very profitable companies was to figure out a goal that would alter the way the world works. Um, Apple, you guys are now walking around with a computer, right? And people are walking into the street getting hit by cars. See how much we've changed? Um, looking at Amazon, you shop, you shop at Amazon. You don't, you, you've closed down Sears and Pennies. <laughs> so um, they, they altered the world with a vision of, I think the world's going to work like this. And that's where they made money. Companies that said, I'm going to go make money, don't really stay in business and don't make as much money as companies that aren't doing that. Um, my experience was during my PhD at the University of Texas, there was a little bit of a mini oil boom. The oil companies came around and they usually chat with some students about interviewing and figuring out they want to give you a job, but they tell you about their company. And about three different companies came in and they said, do you know what our job is? You know what our company is founded for? Uh, you're looking for oil and gas. No, we are here to add stockholder value. I'm like, oh, okay. All three of those companies are out of business. <laughs> um, so I've got good data personally that trying to make money is not a way to make, make money. Um, but in terms of Sony, um, post-World War II, people considered Japanese products the cheap stuff. I bought the cheap stereo. I bought the cheap this. I bought the cheap that. It's that crappy stuff from Japan. Um, Sony said, you know, I don't want people thinking about Japanese products that way. I want them to think, man, I got the Japanese one. And they wanted them to have a lot of pride in Japanese products. And so that's what they set out. That was their BHAG. Um, and you focus on the ultimate goal, not the baby steps. When we went to the moon as a science project, we said, the president just said we're going to the moon. Okay, well, what do we got? Well, we can't get there. We don't have rockets that are strong enough. We don't know how you would do it. We don't know if your eyes will pop out of your head. Okay, you got 10 years. Okay. Um, and it wasn't, we're going to write a small grant proposal and decide what the next small step is from going to the moon. Um, and that's how we normally do research on the university level. We write a grant proposal. We think this is the next reasonable conservative step to take, and we'll go forward like that. And um, we'd be about 50 to 100 years from getting to the moon. Um, we would never have gotten there in 10 years. Um, but, you know, we'd be looking at engines, and we'd be looking at how humans respond to environments. We'd be thinking about getting, maybe putting them up in space at some point to really test it. But we'd be very conservative about it. Um, Entrepreneurial research is a higher risk profile way to do research. You say, I've got a BHAG, how are we going to get there? And sometimes you get funding agencies to jump in on that. And you work on people that have problems. And you say, okay, we've got a problem, we want to solve it, and get other people involved, and they help solve it. Um, and so that ultimate goal is what you're focused on, not how am I going to get that next grant proposal and who am I going to write it to. So. My giant, big, hairy, audacious goal for hydrogeology is that we do the same thing everybody else does. That turns out to be a much bigger goal than I expected. Um, but if we look at the medical community, or look at the seismic industry, um, uh, basically the oil industry now scans their patient first. The medical community scans their patient first. Now, sometimes scans are quite useful very, very quickly. This guy went to the dentist office. Um, he had a sore in the roof of his mouth. And he asked the dentist to help him out. The dentist said, well, let's take an x-ray. And then the dentist said, I'm not the guy for you. Um, and this is how people think scanning should work. They think, oh, I'm going to take the picture. I'll know what I'm looking at. If you put a nail in your head, you will. <laughs> um, but if you said, well, how's that second molar doing? I don't know. I don't know how to read that scan. Well, somebody does, and they can figure out whether his tooth needs to be drilled on or anything. right? So, there's, most scans are more subtle than a nail in your head. But if you go in the oil industry, they're looking at funny wiggles. Right? Um, and, and those funny wiggles were born out of which event? When did we start seismic? We started looking for funny wiggles. 1912. What event? Huh? No. It's a different event. It was the White Star Line. That was the company. Titanic going down. He said, you know, we can maybe find that boat if we bounce sound waves off of it. Might be able to listen for that boat. And somebody in Oklahoma said, you know, we might be able to bounce, bounce waves off of rocks and listen for oil. And so then folks started doing consulting with Seismic and said, what we're going to do is we're going to set off some explosives and listen for your oil. 
that went badly. <laughs> um, there's a quote from a guy doing consulting in the 1920s, and he basically said, the dowsers were ahead of us because they didn't have any science, but at least they had tradition. We were going around saying, we're going to set off some explosives and listen for your oil. It didn't go well. Um, and so when you, when you go to scanning, the x-ray took a while to come on board. Um, MRI took a while to come on board. And what happens is you're actually telling people to change the way they solve their problems. You're saying, yeah, you got this new tool, but it's not going to work the same way that you normally do it. If you got a drill rig out, you go down, I've got oil. OK, great. Well, do I have oil now? Well, you have some good squiggles that are indicative that you might. Well, that drill rig is much more certain. True, but if you combine that drill rig with this seismic, I can take your hits from 30% odds of getting oil to 90 to 90% odds of getting oil. I like 80 to 90% odds, but I don't know what I'm doing with this. And you have to set up a whole industry and you have to deal with that scanning approach. Um, medically, you deal with scanning. You guys have been scanned by somebody. And seismically, we go in and scan places. But environmentally, we tend to take out the drill. Right? Well, we've got a problem out here. OK, get a drill rig. Let's go look. We don't go out and say, let's scan the patient. So my BHAG is that we would do that. So if you're going to do electrical photography and look around under the ground, uh, step one, what do you see? What can you actually take a picture of? So if I want to look at x-rays, I can take pictures of your bones. I can take a picture of nails in your head. Um, I know what I can see. right? So we need the same thing for electrical work. Um, we need to be able to do project planning and decide if you've got a problem, how are we going to solve that? And we've got to think about how to do that. Um, how to acquire field data. We think about how to send the drill rig out, all the people we'd have to call, what kind of clearances we'd have to have. We've got to think about that for taking electrical pictures. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect data where instead of collecting 10 wells worth of data, collecting 100 wells worth of data, I'm going to start out above 10,000 data points. First day, I'll collect 10,000 data points. So I'm going to be working between 10 and 100,000 data points, typically. Um, so I need to be able to visualize that. I need to be able to do data management. I can't get around that. I can't plot this up by hand on something. I've got way too much information. Um, and then finally, you would need to be part of the cookbook or business model that somebody would say, hey, that's a good idea. Let's do that. Um, so that somebody would call you up and give some business the ability to go scan their site. So what does that look like? So I'm up at OSU. We've got people that ride horses. If you didn't know it, Oklahoma is the most horses per capita of any state in the US. Um, and so we have a polo club where people ride horses and hit sticks um, and use the sticks to hit the balls. And they store the horses here, and they have a well, and it went salty. OK, well, why is it salty? Well, there's an oil well down there. What do those guys do? They pump salt water. OK. Well. We can think hydrogeologically. How do we show whether salt water from there came over to here? And what depth do you drill? What do you sample? How do you sample? And how much do you need to prove it in which way? So we can come up with conceptual models. Um, one conceptual model that's possible in still water is that actually you brought saline water up from depth. Um, so there's shallow saline water in still water. You might have just dragged it up. Or maybe it came over from that oil well. So you can think about how to measure that, how many wells you would need, what depth you would put them at. And you could go at it with a physical hydrogeology approach. You could go at it with a chemical hydrogeology approach. Um, electrical approach says, well, this, this approach would be um, conductor coming out of this conductive fluid into this resistive fluid. And if it came from over here, I'd have a conductor that came in from the side. And I can look for where my well screen is at and figure out where the conductor came from. And that might tell me something about what's actually going on for the conceptual model for this site. So if we look at electrical scan of this, there's our well. Um, Statue of Liberty is standing here. I'm going to give you scale. And all these will be trapezoids, um, but they're going to be different sizes. So to get you the right scale, I'm going to forget to tell you what the scale is. So I'll put the Statue of Liberty for big things. I'll put two giraffes, because I couldn't find anything 10 meters tall. A giraffe's five, so two giraffes is 10. And then I've got a person for small images is about two meters. Okay, so I'll stick those for scale. So there's your well. Um, more conductive, low resistivity um, in purple, more resistive um, up here in browns and grays. And here we've got our well, and our well screen is all conductive coming from the bottom. Okay, so you've upcombed. So if you put in wells to the side, you may not even notice your salinity. Um, if you put in monitoring wells off the side, you might not even notice. You might be scratching your head because the middle well is all salty and the ones to the side aren't. 
Um, so your monitoring wells may or may not help you as you put those in. But now you can target not only the problem, you can target other places to think about sticking a different well. You can also think about what pumping rates you might need to avoid upconing. So you're, you're setting up, I, I don't know that this is salt water, but I know I have salt water in this well, in this well screen, and it happens to be really, really conductive in there. So I can integrate these data sets and come up with an understanding of hydrogeology that gives me high density, high spatial density with information that helps me understand the hydrogeology. So I'm going to up cone and I'm going to deal with that. Now, if you understand physical hydrogeology, the real advantage you have is that you already took a class in electrical hydrogeology. All the math is the same. So we've got Darcy's law with a flux is proportional to gradient with a hydraulic conductivity. You've got Ohm's law, flux is proportional to gradient with a electrical conductivity. The only miserable part is when you're writing reports, you always have to say hydraulic conductivity and electrical conductivity. You can't just drop the first part. Um, and you have to be very explicit about these things because you're using laws that are basically very parallel. So you know all the math for Darcy's law, you know all the math for Ohm's law. Now, if Darcy's law is hydraulically conductive, your electrical signal might be electrically conductive. But this opposite is true as well. You might have a hydraulically conductive zone that's your most resistive electrical zone. Um, so it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but the math is the same at least. Application philosophy-wise, I go to a lot of conferences and give these talks with drillers, and there's people that know all sorts of things about pumps I never knew. They know about manifolds, they know about power supplies, they know about all sorts of ways to hook them up, they know what size you need, they know all this sort of stuff. And as a hydrogeologist, I don't care. Um, I don't need to know all that stuff. My main concern as a hydrogeologist is where the on switch is. And I flip it on and I watch the water level change and I understand the aquifer. You go, well, you don't know anything about that pump. I know when you flip the on switch on that it pumps something. Um, and I know that I watch the water level change and I can derive aqua properties. I'm answering different questions than the guy who put the pump in. I'm answering hydrogeologic questions, not questions about how to build a pump. If I go out to an aquifer with a pH meter, I could take out the person that designs pH meters. It'd probably go really bad if I wanted to know something about the aquifer, because the guy who understands pH meters is probably going to change the probe out two, three times, might play with the screen, might do all sorts of things that don't actually get me a good data set that mostly play with the instrument. Um, it's not something I necessarily need. So when I go out to do geophysics, taking a geophysicist with me to get hydrogeologic data may not be the best option, because philosophically, I don't care about the camera, I care about what the data that it provides. And so what I want is a really stable data set that I can rely on for doing hydrogeology without somebody playing with knobs that screw with my QAQC protocols. Um, so if I'm doing hydrogeophysics, I've got a task. I've buried Jimmy Hoffa in this sort of setting. I want to find him. How am I going to do that? Is that detectable with this technique? Electrical hydrogeology, I go, I, I know what my task is. Where's this stuff? Um, in reality, I have no idea except for it's in this gas station, dry cleaner, refinery, trail, rail yard, and some of it squirts out over there where people are upset, and that well seems contaminated. Okay, so what's actually happening under the ground? I don't know, so I'm going to need a camera to look around down there that I can look at and get a reasonable understanding of what's happening under my feet without having a drill rig around and without having somebody moving all the buttons around while I'm trying to interpret the data. In terms of taking the picture, uh, this is a four electrode data set. Um, I used this first as a sophomore in college doing electrical measurements class, and we measured the resistance of copper wire to eight decimal places precisely. And I asked the professor, I said, what do you use this for? He says, we'll use this for very precise electrical measurements. Who cares? And a few years later, I was out in the Bahamas, and somebody was doing a resistivity setup, Bob Ritzy out of Ohio, and um, I said, Bob, is this, a, is this a Wheatstone bridge circuit? He says, yeah, you're the first student ever asked me that. So how many physicists do you hang out with? Um, and it's a Wheatstone bridge circuit. It's an incredibly precise way to measure electrical properties. We do it all the time. If you've used an EC probe, you've used a Wheatstone bridge. A lot of your chemical instruments, you measure things in a lab, you use Wheatstone bridges. Really great way to measure resistance. So you can get very, very precise. And in this case, we can measure one pixel. We watch the current go through, we measure potential. You get one pixel of data about how conductive the Earth is or how resistive the Earth is at that particular, at some point in this space. So 
Back in the pre-1990 era, um, what you could do is electrical drilling. And what you could do with that four electrode measurement is we could move those electrodes and move the current electrodes further and further apart. And when we measured those potentials, we would look deeper and deeper. And so you could take a crew out and you could get about 80 data points a day, about 80 pixels. And you get a picture that's pretty one dimensional. But post 1990, what you could do is instead go with a multi electrode survey. You could set all of your electrodes out and then tell the computer, go. Now you're collecting 80 data, data points and more. Okay, so you're now into basically collecting a kilopixel camera picture. Okay. Not megapixel, not, not as high as some of your optical ones, but you've got a kilopixel camera that's looking in two dimensions and able to collect that data for you. Now, it could collect it one time and you can go take a picture. The same as you can go down with a direct push instrument and pull some water out of a well or out of the ground. Um, but we can also do the same that you do with a well. You install a piece of PVC and you watch it over time. I can install a cable at the top and I can keep taking this picture and seeing how the aquifer changes. But instead of looking at one point in the aquifer of the well, I can look at an entire plane of the aquifer over time. Now, when you get that data, it's data collected at the surface. You've got to develop the film. You've got to invert the data and find out what you've got. In this case, it says, oh, we've got a resistor sitting here. Okay, well, where's the fuel tank? Right up here. Okay, well, is that gasoline? It doesn't say it's gasoline. It says it's really resistive and it's near a fuel tank. Well, how am I supposed to use that? You're going to biopsy it the same way a cancer, cancer doctor would scan you and go, you got something hanging off your kidney. Is that bad? I don't know. We're going to biopsy it, right? Until they biopsy it, they don't really know. And it makes you nervous and you have those sort of issues of like, this could be really bad. I don't know. We'll biopsy you in a week when we can get you in. You're biopsying me now. I want to know. Um, and my, my patients deal with that. They get the, they get the figure and, a, and they go, is that definitely gas? Yeah, you, you might have a, a sand channel that's sitting there, but I doubt it. But what are we going to do to tell that? Don't, don't, can't you tell me? Well, I could bi biopsy it. I could tell you that it's consistent with being gasoline, but until we biopsy it, I don't know. But the same thing that medical scans have. Um, my scans are running about 80, 90 percent accuracy, very similar to seismic forward drilling and targeting. Yep, that target matches what we thought it was. Um, but we might not be certain about it until we biopsy it. Um, if you go into medical scanning, this will freak you out a little bit. Um, they're pretty happy on a scientific basis if the scan's 65 percent accurate. That's their target. You mean it's like a 50-50 that I got something hanging off my kidney? Well, yeah, but we'll biopsy and we'll tell you. Okay. Um, so I, I, I tend to think looking at my data, I'm, I'm somewhere around similar to seismic. It's about 80, 90 percent that we drill into it, we understand what we're looking at. Um, and you're taking pictures that um, basically you're placing about a thousand wells worth of information and you know where to go. Setting up the camera. Um, so we're putting stakes in the ground. Um, in this case, we're going to use 56 stakes. It's going to take a couple hours to collect an image. We're going to lay this out, collect some data, and take it back up. Image size is about 5 to 1. So if we're out here 100 meters, we're looking down 20 meters. If we're out a kilometer, we're looking down 200 meters. If you want to look at the crust of the earth, I had a buddy who used a um, power line from South Africa to Zimbabwe for 1,200 kilometers. You can look through the crust. You're not limited by the physics. What you're limited by is where am I going to stick a straight line that long? So um, in, in terms of doing this, I like to do the most boring geophysics in the world. I don't want a geophysical experiment running. I want an environmental data collection sample. So if I go out to sample benzene, I don't want five guys that are running a lab to figure out how to measure benzene in the lab and they're trying a bunch of things and you come up with five different numbers. I want a very reliable, precise method that it gets the same every time. So this is collected under really strict protocols where boredom is key. Uh, that you know what you're going to get, that you get the same thing each time. Um, when you go entrepreneurial, you need to do this stuff commercially. So um, you need some real key things to have things work commercially. If you send people out in the snow to collect data, you must have a coffee maker and a trailer. Step one. Um, but it also stores things for doing the work. So it stores gear to do surveying. Um, when you're going to do this work, you're going to do it medically. You're going to say, look, I want you to go into that patient right off the side of the kidney and give me a sample. In this case, the kidney would be um, 94 meters along the line and down 16 meters. Please give me a water sample. That's our biopsy. So we got to mark that. So we've got survey gear, um, 
total station with GPS, figure out where we're at in 3D space, and then we mark the ends of the lines with some sort of marker. The yellow disc works quite well on grass, little brass ones on, on uh, pavement. But we mark it so that we can go sample the patient. Um, and then you have to actually acquire this data in real places. So you need traffic control methods to lay out lines and collect data over the streets. Um, you need ways to collect it over waterways. Water is just a high porosity media, but electrically, we just don't need a stake. You just have the electrode touch the water, you're good. Um, so going across waterways doesn't matter. Um, we're not necessarily bringing a drill rig there, but we can take the picture and watch things coming from the uplands and going into the waterways. And all those pictures you saw in hydrogeology textbooks where flow lines go down and then back up happens in the real world. So if you're trying to get your wells to show you, we get a lot of cases where they have an uh, LNAPL site with gasoline, and it's in the uplands, it's in the water, and it's not in between. Um, the flow lines go down and back up. Um, and very commonly, that's what we see in the data sets. So going across the waterways, going across roads and waterways, having cops stand there. Uh, we went through a bottling plant this year, so we got nice pictures of people going past the computer desk into the bottling plant, do these sort of things. Any place that you can get a straight line, you can take a picture. And you can put a straight line in a lot of places you didn't think you could. If we want to watch over time, instead of putting in a vertical monitoring well, I put in a horizontal one. So I trench in, put my cable down, I've got a piece of PVC, if you open it up, instead of seeing a place to measure water level, you see a cable connector. And I can connect to that and watch over time. And instead of monitoring one point in space for fluid chemistry or water level, I can monitor the picture of the ground over time and see what's changing. The rocks don't move. So I can watch up at the top, I can watch soil moisture changes. If I've got bacteria growing, they'll get more conductive. If I inject conductive stuff to clean something up, I can watch where that injectate went. And I'm monitoring it, but I'm monitoring in a different way than if I was using a well. So if we put on cameras and put on our glasses to look around with our nice electrical camera, um, things that get brighter, light bulbs, salt in solution, clay particles, bacterial growth, um, microbes, say, what kind of electronic scepter are you? They talk about electrical things with microbes because they're really good at it and they make a living with electricity. They actually show up in the images as well. Different kinds of microbes show up in different ways because their bodies are a bit different um, and their reactions that they're running are a bit different. But they show up as conductors in the images. The dark parts, the places behind the light bulbs. Gasoline, about 10 to the 10th ohmmeters for a fine product. Solvents, PCs, about 10 to the 13th ohmmeters. Really, really resistive stuff. And it's a liquid, we dump it in the ground, we make dark parts. Um, most um, electrical pictures aren't good at looking for dark parts, so you need to look for the dark parts. Sand channels, dark parts. Hydraulically high conductivity, electrically, the clean stuff that electricity doesn't go through around the silts and the clays that like to pass electricity. So it's the part that's hard to see in the picture. So if you're going to take pictures, you got to have pictures that see the dark parts. So here's a good boring picture, two giraffes. And it's dry granite. And thousands of data points that say, you know, dry granite is pretty resistive. So I, I did these sort of overkill experiments because I was trying to find data sets that had simplicity. I kept getting really complicated things, and I wanted to see something simple. So it turns out dry granite's resistive. Um, sand, slightly more complicated. So we got sand, you got a water table, capillary fringe, unsaturated zone. Take a picture of that. And if you put a well in there, you would see sand, you'd see a water table up here. Electrically, you see pretty uniform conductivity in this reasonably homogeneous sand. Maybe another layer right through there. And then above that, it's getting less resistive. And you go, well, why didn't it look uniform in the Vado zone? Because it's not uniformly dry in the Vado zone. It's varying water content. It's higher water content by the water table. And you're looking at those changes. So you go, well, where's the water table at? Well, it's it with the well, it's about here. And you go, well, if you didn't have that, would you know where the water table's at? Not necessarily, especially in more complicated geology. So what use is that? Well, I'm going to use this to understand the Vado zone and the phreatic zone. I'm going to use the wells to biopsy my understanding. It's the integrated data set that becomes very valuable, the same as if you're going in for a medical scan. Here's more complicated. Here's that dolomite we've been talking about today, southern Oklahoma and the Arbuckle group. And here it is next to this fault. And you have orders of magnitude of hydraulic conductivity, or I'm sorry, electrical conductivity variability in a dolomite that has no temperature variability, no chemistry variability. Well, what's this picture for? Because we don't have anything. Dolomite should be one number. The chemistry is all the same. It should be one number. True. 
But the epikarst has much higher porosity and is weathered and it's made it more conductive. And these, um, this hanging wall, this fault, these fractures are much more conductive and more hydraulically conductive. So it's showing you places where porosity is high and where you would site wells. It shows you places not to site wells. These resistive zones are very, very low porosity dolomite. Um, you can drill wells into these areas and you could store food and it wouldn't get wet. Um, so you know what the different zones are. You're defining the hydrogeologic properties by defining the porosity structure and where it's deformed. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty boring dolomite and it's pretty boring water chemistry, but pretty exciting hydrogeology. And you're getting a tool that gets you the density to see the things you need to understand the structure of that hanging wall and the epicarst zones on top of it. Up in Nebraska, uh, they've got a, a salt marsh. Um, the salt marsh has little critters that survive. And the salt marsh was, was the key for founding Lincoln, Nebraska. They saw salt coming out at the surface in the creek. Obviously, that means there's white gold down below. We'll go mine that salt out, and we'll make a bunch of money. Um, so they found in Lincoln, Nebraska, and then they were dismayed when they found out that the Dakota sandstone has saline fluids in it that discharge to the surface. There's no white gold. So when you're failed that badly, you found a university and go on your way. So they founded the University of Nebraska and stopped trying to find the white gold. But here you have five pixels worth of data, and you're going to try to understand something about the environment of that marsh. The marsh is salty, and it's getting fresher. It's a backwards issue for most people. Usually they're getting salty and trying to fix that. This one's getting fresher, and there's critters that are endangered that like it a little salty. So the question is, is the Dakota still providing water up there? The primary change since humans moved in is that that stream in size by about six meters. It used to be a marsh with a stream about that deep. Now it's about a six meter deep actual channel. Um, so you, it's a slight change. So did that affect the flow net of the system? And is water coming from the Dakota up? And how's that doing that? We can do that with wells. And we can tell that it's going up. We can look at hydraulic gradients. We can look at chemistry and decide whether it's salty down there. But in terms of understanding how it's flowing up to the marsh, how many wells do you need to put in to truly understand that? And getting a drill rig into this marsh is not trivial. So putting the stakes in, we can look around. Um, larger image with the Statue of Liberty. The dots represent minimums in the image. And we get these minimums that all head to the stream. And we get three of them coming in there. Um, and you're basically looking at flow lines coming into the stream, and they're not going to the marsh. They should be going up to the top. They're just going to the bottom of that changed boundary condition. So you have normal flow lines going to a stream like you'd expect, but that's not how the system used to operate. So it, we actually went out to the stream. You crossed the stream from where we were at, and you could stick the EC meter into spots that were fairly narrow, and you could find that big kick in salinity. Um, and so now the salinity distribution, instead of being a marsh that has a range of salinities, it's an ever-freshening marsh with some points of discharge in the stream that are much saltier. And so when you look at the distribution of those endangered species, they tend to live in lines along the stream uh, boundaries. Um, and they tend to live in their little spot that their salinity's at. Because instead of being a plain, it's now just a line. Uh, but looking at it with electrical data, you can understand that much more richly than you could. And you would probably never understand that poking around with a drill rig. Because a drill rig wouldn't poke around where most of the action is in that image. Thinking about stuff going through soil, where well, this is where we're watching the trees fight. And so this was watching the grass and all the, the data on the site watching it over time. We kept seeing soil water moving sideways. And I thought soil water is most supposed to go downward, but it doesn't like to go downward. So we, we decided to look around. So this is um, uh, soil on top of weathered sandstone. The weathered sandstone is somewhat higher hydraulic conductivity than the soil. And thinking about why does stuff look like it's moving sideways? Um, we can do a little experiment, and this is a little infiltrometer that's a meter by a meter. We could fill it up with water. I'm told that's somewhat offensive to Vado Zone folks to put full water on there. But we wanted to see why things look like they're moving sideways. If you fill that with water and you take two pictures, one before and one after, under where you put the water, it gets more conductive. That's not a stunning bit of science. Um, but it never goes down keeps going off the top of that sandstone. And it's not because that sandstone's low conductivity. It's because it's a capillary barrier. In the Vado zone, it's a place that's not going to go in. If we're in the phreatic zone, I'd be quite happy to go in that sandstone. So here we get it all wet. 
but it's getting all wet 10 meters to the side and never gets wet below where we put the water at. So if we think about this as contaminants and you spilled the contaminants, okay, well, we're going to go sample the oil spill. Okay, it went down to the bedrock and stopped. It only made it through the soil. We sampled underneath here, it was clean. Okay, great, did you sample 10 meters to the side? No, why would you do that? So that's where I think all the stuff's at. Why would you think that? Well, because you went through a capillary barrier, you can't go straight down through a capillary barrier. And we've done this in a gravel as well, found the same thing. We find that soil water loves to shoot sideways for tens of meter scale um, before it starts breaking through and getting down. And we looked in the literature and numerically, They've dealt with this, and they've dealt with this in lab scale experiments. It's really unstable to deal with capillary barriers. So the concept of the Vado zone being reasonably boring and that the water went down through there, got to the water table, I don't think that exists in, re in reality. I think most times it's shooting around sideways a fair bit. Um, and we'll find more about that over time. But these experiments make a good way to find out those things. A little ecology at the dry cleaner. This was a dry cleaner for 30 years. Um, PCE got into the ground. Um, this is injection wells. What they wanted to do was remediate PCE by having bacteria go to work for them. Here's the deal. I'll offer you carbon, and then I want you to eat that carbon, breathe PCE, and break it down for me. Seems like a fair deal, a cheeseburger for breaking down PCE. I'll take it. Um, so they injected. They had the monitoring wells. Nothing ever showed up. They saw no change in chemistry. They saw no injectate. And they asked then, well, we could put in more monitoring wells. Well, why don't you scan that? Let's see what happened. Um, and so we got these scans sitting here between the injection wells and the monitoring wells. And we get some weird data. We can look at that data. I took out the middle colors and just made it gray. These are values that would make sense in this site. These values don't make sense in this site. Okay, this is a sand aquifer with 10 parts per million chloride in it. Um, there's nothing interesting. There should be maybe 50 or 100 ohm meter kind of thing. This stuff is equivalent to being dry granite or more resistive. So if you sample down in there and biopsy it, you find PCE. And what it is is you've put 10 to the 13th ohm meter resistor in there, and you've blocked off that pore space. And when you did that, you get a spot electricity doesn't want to go through. It ends up being dark on the image and colored red in this case. These conductive parts, that looks like you spilled seawater. But you're 10 parts per million chloride. There's no seawater problem here. Um, what this is is the microbes. And you're looking at their bodies. When we look at Dean Apple sites, we tend to find really, really conductive microbes, much more so than fuel sites. And I've got microbiologists that attend these talks, and they tell me, I think it's because of this. And they're really definitive, but very, very different answers between them. <laughs> so I'm still waiting to figure out why microbes on a Dean Apple site are much more conductive than fuel degraders. And I've got some folks working on a site with me that's highly impacted but highly degrading. And maybe we'll end up with an answer as to what they're doing. I've got hypotheses about metals, hypotheses about um, building cables to deal with redox issues, all sorts of crazy combinations. But functionally, they're built with bodies that are roughly the same resistivity, but they have some body parts that are different, and they do different things with metals and different reactions. So um, there's a lot of things in there that we don't understand. But if you sample there, you get PCE as well. But you get everything down through vinyl chloride. So you're not seeing those resistors in there because they're wire wrapped by bodies. Um, and they're hiding the PCE inside their bodies. But you can figure out where to sample. So this one I can tell you that much more resistive equals much more PCE. This one I can tell you that microbes are pretty happy. And I can sample it and tell you that they're degrading quite happily. Um, problem is, is, is this PCE that's a Dean Apple dense non-aqueous phase liquid sinker off the side of the image is off the bottom of the image. And I do a lot of work in Dean Apple sites where we take the picture and I tell people, if you don't want to know, don't take the picture. I said, why? Because <laughs> Dean Apple is a sinker and it sinks. It didn't sink on my site. Why do you know that? Because our deepest well, we, we have an understanding of the site. Well, how, how deep is your deepest well? 30 feet. How deep is your deepest Dean Apple sample? 30 feet. And geologically, what's stopping it from going down further? Nothing, but I know it doesn't go down. OK, well, prepare yourself. <laughs> um, and so we take the picture, and they go, oh, wait a minute. There's a big resistor under my wells. Yes, there is. Is that Dean Apple? I don't know. Is it consistent with Dean Apple? That's yeah, consistent with Dean Apple, but until you biopsy it, I don't know. Uh, and, and so people have trouble with that. A, a drill rig will tell you exactly. 
I've got where to biopsy and I've got consistent with. Um, so it's a different way to look at the world, but I'll tell you exactly where to go. Limits, they're electrical pictures. Um, if you want to do chemistry, I've got to calibrate it somehow. And if you want to do a process imaging, you've got to take more than one survey. Um, but for a lot of spots in hydrogeology, it's one dimensional features or things that are not nice continuous features. And finding them, if we're poking around with a drill rig, we don't do well with certain problems. So we can look at fuel as a problem. So this is John Wilson. He was formerly of the EPA Ada Groundwater Lab. Uh, he runs Scissor Tail Environmental now, uh, where he tells people what to do. Um, real good NAPL expert. And this was um, Mary O'Kelly. She was the head of the Oklahoma Corporation Commission Petroleum Storage Tank Division and dealt with leaky underground storage tanks in Oklahoma. Um, when people come out to look at the site, they want excitement. If you're taking electrical pictures, they think sparks. They think excitement. Um, there's no sparks. It just the electrons are flying around and nothing's really happening. Um, if you've got 56 undergrads, if they all grab one each, they will scream at the appropriate times. That makes it more exciting. But otherwise, it's just sitting there. So, um, so they're sampling next to these wells, and we'll talk about this site. But um, if you come out, I, I've had, I had, uh, we did a site with Marcus down in Mexico, and we had a Mexican hydrogeologist come out. Beautiful, he didn't even have white jeans, and beautiful. I gave him a hammer in the middle of the jungle and put him to work, and he didn't look so beautiful at the end of the day. So just a warning if you come out to watch. Uh, Carol is a consultant that I've worked on several projects with. She says, I don't like how you describe your work. Okay. <laughs> um, and this is the entrepreneurial research perspective. Um, she thought about the data this way. And I, I tried it a few different ways. I had a few different slides. But she thinks about it as going from low resistivity to high resistivity. Dean Apple's really resistive. Uh, high groundwater EC. Salty plumes and metal plumes are conductive. Um, salt water's there. And what signal ends up covering up other things in the picture. Um, so things that cover up other parts of the picture, and she tries to think about that in priority. And then puts this to say, well, if you're looking at non-aqueous phase liquids, we're looking from clean to blocking off some pore space. You can see that because you're making a resistive thing that's hard to get through. And you don't necessarily have to fill up the media. You don't have to be full to get a signal. Um, so she was thinking about it different ways, and I've got different folks that tell me different ways to think about it. Um, and that's been helping over time. With seeing sort of the middle picture there of a little bit of NAPL, we actually had problems that we were detecting too, level, too low of concentrations. We were detecting in the field concentrations between 1 and 10 part per million of non-aqueous phase liquids. And so typically in the well, you'd see dissolved phase at about 1 to 10 parts per million. And I would see something out outside the well. And they'd go, well, how are you detecting 1 to 10 parts per million dissolved phase? Well, I'm looking out in the media. You're looking in a plastic tube with some holes in it. Um, so what I'm looking at, uh, our hypothesis was, is that if you fill in the pore space with some NAPL, I got 10 to the 11th ohm meters there for a fuel. I got 10 to the 17th for quartz. I make a fairly resistive layer. And if I look at cross sections, um, I'm making a pretty resistive layer sitting there. And I'm trying to pass electricity through there. At that point, I don't need a lot of resistor to block off electricity. And so we found that somewhere around 1 to 10 parts per million, we get a signal in the field. But we did the experiment in the lab and said, yeah, you actually, you're blocking off electricity and you don't need that much. You need to put a, a film. You don't need to fill a block. Um, and so it helped us understand how to deal with the data for that. On the conductive side, there's a field called biogeophysics. Um, and what they look at is a lab scale and smaller as to what these guys are doing geophysically. Some of them make magnetite. Uh, some of them do other reactions. I'm looking at them making my, my life more conductive. So one of the ways, some of them have nanowires. So they have their own wires they build because they deal with electricity. Um, so those nanowires are about a one ohmmeter wire. People, some biologist somewhere has cut that out and measured it, um, which seems strange to me that you could do that. But I guess somebody's done it. Um, but in terms of what they do and what their body parts do, um, we see quite a bit of variability in their electrical ecology uh, as we look across sites. But we don't know why. Um, we've started sampling the, the conductors with DNA samples and starting to figure that out and working with microbiologists. But we see a lot of variability that we know we're looking at microbial activity. We don't know what the structure and the values mean yet. Um, but we know that there, there's bugs growing there. I call it the mold on the bread in the subsurface because I 
grew mold in my bread as a college student. Um, and so I know what that looks like and I can relate to it. So if you start off with recently molded bread, you get some dots. In my pictures of a contaminated site, I'll get some dots where some mold is growing and you're getting some, conduct some microbes and they're getting more conductive. If you get sort of a middle-aged or middle, and middle-aged isn't by years, it's by growth. Um, you've walked in and you took out that loaf and you said, oh, I'm making a sandwich, you pull it out and there's mold all over the bottom. We find that if there's a temperature control, they'll tend to grow on one side like you put a growth lamp. So if there's heat from the bottom or heat from the top, they'll tend to mold up on that side. And if you're looking at a really old thing that's nice and moldy, the whole thing will be molded over and you'll be looking at this big conductive mass. Um, so what, as far as what their structure is, that's trickier. So this is that site with those regulators. Um, this was cleaned up twice. So they had a spill, they did pump and treat, they did a surfactant flush, and then they wanted to look at the site. And I was kind of intimidated because I'm like, well, you've cleaned it. Am I going to find anything? 15 years later, I'm going, I'm always going to find something. You've left stuff behind in every site you've cleaned, which freaks regulators out. But in this case, they left behind these couple blobs, and that blob is the most contaminated spot on the site ever found. Even before they cleaned it up. But if you come over here a few feet, this is a total of 15 meters, about 50 feet. Come over here a few feet, I can give you a clean boring. And so I actually got into the fun on a research basis. I took a small area about like that, and I wanted to change the conceptual model of what was contaminated. And so I do one over there that was clean. I do one over here that said the sand was contaminated. I do one here that said the clay was contaminated. I do this one that would say both are contaminated. And I do it in a small area to really freak people out. Um, and you can lie, cheat, and steal, or change the exceptional model, and you go, most sites we have one boring every so often, and we come up with what's happening in 3D. Yeah, and Apple, Apple kind of giggles at that. Um, so all of these wells were clean, non-detect. Um, the sampling through here said more resistive equaled more gasoline. This site's much different. I'm looking at gasoline again. I'm looking at a map view. There's a UST. Um, Here's a really conductive side of it. Here's a really conductive side, but not quite as conductive. There's some resistor back here. There's some fuel that were, was upgrading of what they expected. That was one of their problems. They had some unweathered mass up here. But these are really interesting to us because this is much more conductive than this. And I gave a talk on this at the University of Texas, and somebody said, they're backwards. You must have labeled it wrong. I said, why? Well, they said, methanogen should be much more conductive than guys that deal with oxygen. I'm like, OK. But I know my data's right. And I went to EPA and they said, no, no, it's that way because these guys have chloroblasts. I said, what is that? They said, well, it's one of their body parts. These guys have them, those guys don't. Oh, okay. So I, it's fun listening to microbiologists because they always tell me very definitive things, but they're always different from each other. Um, so what I've realized is that there's information there. So you can see there's an interesting zone here. These guys aren't fully one value. Um, this has got patchiness as well. So microbial growth patterns that I see are tend to be patchy. But in terms of what we're seeing for data, we're learning that you're going to be able to do some speciation of some species. These guys might be lumped together because they both have chloroblasts, and maybe I can't distinguish them. Maybe there's nothing to tell me the difference. Um, but we can think about farming them. And so we've made some proposals to say, hey, can we go in and farm these guys? We're not just going to give them some carbon and say go. We're going to monitor them. We're going to model them. I've got a, a numerical modeler who does microbes in his models. And we're going to actually tweak them and farm them to make them work for us, as opposed to just saying, here's some cheeseburgers, good luck. Um, and, and what happens in the microbiologist is you go, well, if you dump cheeseburgers down there, they all eat them. They may not go to work for you. Some, one guy might be dealing with PC, and the other guy's going, thanks for the, thanks for the cheeseburger, dude. Um, so you could, you could farm them some more by forcing them to do your reactions if you've got some control over them. If you can watch them, model them, and farm them, we could do some more things. So I list that our knowledge of what to do with these is about at 5%. I think we've got 20 times more that we'll learn about how to monitor them, how to measure them, and how to work with them and put them to work for us. I don't know if we have to pay them or not. So looking at conceptually a BHAG of scanning a site. So um, you have a well in the middle of absolutely nowhere in the Arbuckle Dolomite. The only thing out there for a possible source is two 1,000-gallon um, diesel tanks. 
There's no way that's a problem because you got secondary containment. And then you add humans. Humans put in 20 foot of casing on a 1,200 foot deep well. Even in 1950s when they installed it, 20 foot of casing wasn't enough casing. But it's in the middle of nowhere. And then when you do secondary containment on 2,000 gallons of diesel, you put a valve on the tank. But you know, it's much easier to take the hose, strap it up to the top of the tank and zip tie it versus actually closing the valve. And then when the zip tie breaks, the hose gets you right over secondary containment. That might have been the way it happened. I, I can't guarantee that. Um, so anyways, you've got 2,000 gallons of diesel into a 1,200 foot deep fractured karst dolomite well. You get about a six foot free product on, on top of that at a 100 foot deep water table. You have a perched water table that's contaminated. Go. So, scan so that you can see the 100 foot depth and put in wells to your fractures. We did that, so the wells were actually sited in fracture zones. They had trouble because I gave them such rotten rock that they weren't used to it and they lost the first well and had to redo it. Um, they weren't used to finding zones that were that damaged and weathered. Um, then we took a couple scans here right in the source zone. Um, we're going to look at one of those here. So we've got the water well, you got the tank sitting here, you got the image, um, and we're going downhill to the left. Um, so we'll take a look at that image. Comes out about like that, a couple of giraffes, conductor, resistor. Well, I've told you ways that you can have fuel being conductive. I've had you ways that fuel could be resistive. So which one is the contaminated one? On a lot of my sites, both. You've got areas that are impacted that aren't microbial active. You've got areas that are impacted that are microbial active. Um, and so you got to look around. And I've got a lot of my sites where you also have the signal of, what did you guys try to clean this with? Well, we tried pump and treat. We tried an air sparge. We tried a, a flush of this. We injected some of that. We did this. And then we thought you guys could make it much simpler for us. After I added about 12 signals to what's on the ground. Um, but in this case, I don't have any cleanup yet. We just scanned it. Um, so could be some microbes growing there in the middle. Could be some diesel sitting over there on the right. Okay. So we could put the tank in there and where the excavation pit was and the water well with the casing. I want to biopsy that resistor now. <laughs> that looks pretty suspicious. It's in the right location. It's right below things. It's very resistive relative to the rock body. We should sample that. But downhill to the left, man, does that get nice and conductive and it goes down? Uh, we should, I'd like to sample that too. So sample that one. Hey, non-detect. Um, it turns out that the logger didn't see the same weathering profile, a little bit different. But we have that that's basically weathered dolomite and being more weathered is more conductive. Go check the big resistor and the one in between. Now they're both impacted. Okay, well we have resistive fresh product. Um, I've had a site with fresh spills that was all conductive. Really weird ecology, different talk. Um, when we get those wells in there, we can draw in the geology. We see that soil layer is conductive. The weathered bedrock is not as conductive, but still conductive. And there's disagreement on that well about where it stops being weathered, right? So you could have a debate about that. You could re-drill it. You could sample the rock body and figure out why it's weathering. But that's not a concern of us for the patient. So we're not going to do that because it's clean. Um, so put in a couple of remediation wells. We did um, uh, skimmer wells. We did uh, surfactant flush in this because we knew where things were at. Um, and we did techniques that were fairly aggressive because we knew where we were looking. We knew where the fractures were. We knew what the fractures were saying. We knew where the perch system was. We knew where the diesel was sitting. We knew the full paths. Um, a little under two years, this was non-detect. In the, in the supply well and all the monitoring wells were non-detect in under two years. 2,000 gallons were removed. We have the tools to do that if we knew where to go. Um, and in this case, we took a look and knew where to go. So we could take a temporal picture. And we can see what changed is the area around the diesel. This area that was clean, eh, it dried out a little bit like the soil. It got a little more resistive. So it supports the weathering hypothesis that, yeah, it's a little more weathered. It's a little more connected to the surface. So it drained out a little bit, dried out a bit, got a little more resistive. But the part that was impacted by diesel, including the part going down, got much more conductive. You've cleaned out resistor. There's a little bit of bio growing there now. Um, and 
Now you have a non-detect with a little bit of biogrowth that'll probably do any polishing that's needed if there is a little bit left in there. But you basically use the tools you had on a chemical and physical place basis and used 50 to 100,000 data points to figure out where to put them and how to use the tools in the appropriate way spatially. So if you're looking at fuel, you're looking at conductive and resistive signatures and mechanisms, really useful for funny shapes. Really useful determining monitor natural attenuation. By looking at microbes, you can determine whether monitor natural attenuation is appropriate. You need data integration, you need a 3D view. You can't get out of that. You've got to do a 3D model because you have too much data. Electrical hydrogeology, if I'm looking in 2D, I see things that uh, 1D data can't. It's not that you're a hugely better hydrogeologist, you know where to look, right? So if, if I'm a medical doctor, I can go and do open surgery on your stomach and if I dig around long enough, I'll find there's something hanging off the kidney. There's probably better ways to do it. Um, and if you do the scan, I don't know what's off your kidney. The guy that opened you up and dug around knew, but if I biopsy it after checking, um, it's a different way to go about it, but I can figure out the answer. You've got to have data understanding of all the data types. Um, I had a project manager working at GSA booth, and she had two geophysicists come up and they said, you should hire us. And she said, why? We're geophysicists. We should work for your company. You do geophysics. Well, we do geophysics with the intent of understanding hydrogeology. So how many hydrogeology classes have you had? None. Well, can you tell me degradation pathways for PCE down to vinyl chloride? What's PCE? How about fuel degradation? You know anything about microbial degradation and how to look for that in groundwater chemistry? No. So what are you going to do for my company? We're geophysicists. She said, well, I got a camera. I, I, the geophysics I've sorted out. We, we basically do a very prescribed set of geophysics. So what else are you going to do for me? Um, and she was messing with them, and I, I was appreciating her cruelty. She was very professor-like. Um, but I also realized that we don't ask the same questions in electrohydrogeology as a geophysicist. We're trying to understand what the fluids are doing, what reactions are occurring, and that's our goal. We just happen to be using a geophysical data set instead of using a chemical or a physical data set. So um, I want to scan before I drill. I get really uncomfortable taking a drill rig out and poking into something. Like, well, take a picture first. And people that don't have pictures and don't drill into pictures, they don't need that as much. But I'm like a knee surgeon that's been doing MRIs for years and you tell me, hey, just open his knee up and sort it out. Whoa, I don't want to do that. So I know that it hurts me to drill into something without a picture. So I think scanning first and then drilling will become more common. Um, once you've got to the point where for contaminated sites, instead of saying we're going to poke holes until we understand it and we're going to clean until the method works, um, if we go in and we take the pictures figure out the appropriate cleaning method, clean it up and leave. Once we're at that point, the BHAG is obtained because we're using dense electrical data. And it might be this method, it might be somebody else's. I think it'll be electrical. Um, but um, we can use data that you can collect at high density to solve problems hydrogeologically using our drill rigs as a biopsy tool instead of as a, quote, characterization tool when it's really not. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Lots of folks have helped out. Um, and if you go into Oklahoma and you want to sample on ice, you can do that. Um, the only thing with Oklahoma ice is you need very small students. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. The preceding program was brought to you as a community service lecture by the Edwards Aquifer Authority. For more information, visit edwardsaquifer.org.